Hi, thanks for joining us for the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South. I'm Chris Cooper. Mowing is essential for maintaining a beautiful lawn. Today we're going to talk about how to do it. Also, wildflowers are beautiful and can attract bees, butterflies, and even hummingbirds into your garden. That's just ahead on the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South. Production funding for the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South is provided by the WKNO Production Fund, the WKNO Endowment Fund, and by viewers like you. Thank you. Welcome to The Family Plot. I'm Chris Cooper. Joining me today is Booker T. Lee. Mr. Booker is a UT Extension agent right here in Shelby County, and Andy Williams will be joining me later. All right, Booker, let's talk about the correct way to cut your lawn, because we don't okay. want to cut it too low, right? Right. The correct height. So right. how do we go about doing that? Chris, normally we got two types of warm sitting grass, but moody grass and zoysia grass. Okay. And you got cool sitting grass, fescue, you got some blue grass, we have blue grass also too. Right. Those are cool season grass in there. For your warm season grass, like your zoysia and moody grass, it want to be somewhere between two and a half inch tall. Okay. For your blue uh, cool season grass, like blue grass, about three inches tall. Okay. Now, what, what you do, Chris, you, you can come over here and, and, and adjust your lawnmower right here. Now, see these out right here, these here, they would adjust your lawnmower right okay. there. And what you can do, you can get your ruler, put on the ground, right here, up to where you want it to mow be on a level, level surface. Okay. You want to get it two and a half inches tall or three inches tall, depending on what grass you cut in there. Right. And the day I load my lawnmower blade real low, the cutter spot just shows what it looked like if you cut it too low. Okay. And how that grass can be damaged like that, you know, we cause problems in that zone. I want to cut it real okay. low this time. You watch how I look and see the difference in, okay? Okay, I will. Oh wow! Oh, see that? Definitely skipped it. Huh? Skipped that. Look at that. Yeah. You can see the difference between the height and the real low there. Sure can. Hey, big difference in there. So you don't yeah. want to scalp the grass. I almost see the roof right now. You sure can. If sun hit that, it can it can kill that grass. Okay. You can have a lot of brown spots in your lawn, and you wonder why. Why my grass look brown like that? <laughs> the roots of the sun right on it. Right. Right there on it there. So you keep it at the right height, then it's kind of shading it out a little bit. Okay. And protect that grass in there. And I'll tell you something else too. When you scalp your yard like that, it makes that lawn thin. The weeds can actually <laughs> outcompete <laughs> your grasses. Right. right. Cause sun, they like right. sun too. That's right. And they, they you see them weeds, they start sprouting. They just start popping up. And, 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 and yes, then So let's say you're out there cutting your yard, right? Okay. And you have maybe a little bump or a stump used to be there, or mm -hmm. the ground is depressed for whatever reason, and you're scalping it. How would you repair that scalping? That, that, that happened that happen a lot. That happened a lot of times. Yeah. You had a tree there or something like that. And the roots of me then that ground might be low right it's there. Low. You cut it, you cut it at the right height, but time you get to, the, to that spot, yeah, just, it just it mow drop down and and and, and, and cause it to be brown. Right. What you need to do probably get some more topsoil or something spread over that area, okay. some little sand and try to level that area up or something. Cause if you keep scabbing that over period over and over again, eventually that grass gonna die there. Right. So you wanna get some come some topsoil and try to build that area up. Okay. In there if you put, and because you don't want to keep scapping it like that every time. Right, because eventually the grass will grow up through it. It will go know, back through that, yeah, to yeah. catch on through that and everything. Yeah. But, but keep, don't, don't, don't adjust your mow for that. That could be fish to spot. Right, right. And, and like you said, your mow is already at the right, right height. Yeah, 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 yeah. Just a little depression yeah, yeah. or something, you know, stump, mm -hmm. you know, rotted and whatever the case may be. Right. Another thing, when you, when you get the mow to the right height, okay. a lot of times I like to cut my grass in different directions. Okay. You want to cut it this way this time. Next time, cut it this way here, just like I put like put fill down, mm -hmm. different direction. So, so why the different directions though? One of the things that you want that grass to stand up. Right. Okay. When I first started doing that, it was hard to go against the grain. Because <laughs> normally you grab that mm -hmm. land, you cut it one way. Right. And you get the lawnmower out the garage and just start cutting. Right. I did that for years and years. I've done that. I then now, now I cut my grass. I cut it any way I want to. Right. Because the grass is standing straight up. Okay. That means good for the water can get down to the root system. The fertilizer can get down to the root system and not no runoff. If your grass laying one way, that will hit that grass and it run off. Right. It's not getting down to the system. So this time, try cutting your grass in a different direction, you will see a big difference in that grass there. Okay. And, and, and you can do that whether it's a warm season grass or a cool season grass. Season grass yeah. Okay. Another thing that had that blade sharp. Oh, yes, sir. Had that blade right. sharp now. Normally, I try my blade twice during the growing season. Okay. To make sure I got a good clean cut. That's right. That's right. And there, so that grass stand up. You want that grass to stand up. Let's go back to the to the blade for a second. You always used to tell us what? Make sure you know how to take it off, right? <laughs> yeah, make sure right. they, I did that one time. On that I did that one time. I took the blade off. All right. And, and the guy said, how did your blade come off the, <laughs> this way or that way? I marked my blade now if yeah, I know how to go back one in there. Okay. Take it off, take the one the hardware strong, get it sharp, and then put it back on there. Okay. 
Good. You know, and, 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 and it, it, you'll, you'll see a different that cut. Okay. Mm -hmm. Let me ask you this. So if you have this grass here, can you go back over that or can you bag that or how would you do that? No, you, you, you wait for a long time. You might want to bag that or run back across there. Okay. Now, the, 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 the much and more, right. that grass is really good for your lawn. Right. It do add a little nitrogen to the soil. That's right. You got a little, you got a little kiss on there, for the play on it, be, make it kind of look soft a little bit. Okay. A lot of folks thought a long time ago that add thatch to your lawn, but that grass will rot and decay in good organic material. Okay. Good organic okay. material in there. In there. And one yeah. last thing I want to ask, so is there a certain type of lawn mower that you like to use more than the other or what? Does well, I, would just, I, I got a, a much and more, and I also okay. got a bag on there too. Okay. I can bag that grass if I need to, and I can much it in there. And when I say I have a bag that grass, if you got any kind of disease on your lawn, any kind of fungus on that grass, you want to bag that. Okay. You don't want to just leave it on that. You don't want to leave those clippings on your lawn. Right. You want to bag that and put it somewhere dispose that grass. Okay. You don't want to use it in your compost pile. Right. You don't right. want to you don't want that disease in, in, in whatever you put it around. Yeah. Yeah. Because they okay. be stay on there. Okay. You got dead grass, disease grass, bag it. Bag it. Bag it. Yeah. Throw it away. Throw it away. <laughs> okay. Uh, another question would be this. So, I mean, when do you like to cut your, your yard? I mean, well, do you wait till the dew dries off or you know, I, what if it just got through raining or, you know? I think that's a cool question there because a lot of time I okay. see people cutting their grass when it's wet and that is not good for the grass. Okay. And really not good for your lawnmower either. Because when that grass wet, that mow taking, it's taking more power to cut that grass. Right. Because then you got a much more, it's not going to be mushed up real good. You got a bag on there, it's not throwing it back to the bag. Yeah. Your grass is not, it's not going to look good when you cut it when it's wet. I like for my grass to dry off. You know, if I can cut it in the evening time, when, you know, in the evening time it'll be fine, as long as I can put no water on it. It'll even be, <laughs> be a good time to do that. Uh -huh. But you want to make sure that grass is dry, and you don't want to cut it when it's wet. Right. Because you look on your lawn with all that grass and get up under them. You're really, you're really killing your lawn more life. Because wow. you're pulling it harder and not doing anything, not cutting the grass good, and it's not, it not going to look good. Right, mm -hmm. right. And plus, like you said, you'd be choking the lawnmower out. Choking the lawnmower out, yeah. Right, right. Because mm -hmm. that grass, you know, it's a big clump of grass. It's a big clump of grass. It's not wet. It's not cutting good. It rolls up into a ball sometimes, mm -hmm. so it could be real difficult. Now, I see folks doing that sometimes, too. It, 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 it's, not, it's not good. I've seen it's not good on, It's not good on your lawnmower, and it's not good for your grass. Right. Usually mm -hmm. when I see it, they not cutting it at the right height, and then they cutting it when it's wet. So it's a double whammy. Double whammy to everything in there. Then you couldn't when it's wet it. Your blade can do it faster yeah. too. Okay. Yeah, you can, so you need to make sure you do it right. All right. Thank you for that information, Booker. Appreciate that. Enjoy it. Right. Right? Yeah. Thank you much. Right. Let's talk a little bit about summer heat care. Usually, when I'm in my yard, the first thing I do is I put on my big hat. Then the next thing I do after that, I always use sunscreen. So I'll put on my sunscreen. Now, if I'm feeling hot, feeling thirsty, I always have some water with me. It's always best to drink water. So I drink a little water. And how about this idea, right? So I have to drink a little bit of the water, right? How about we pour some of the water on this towel here, right? Then we can put this wet towel on your neck to cool you off. How about that? Now remember this, anytime you're out in the garden, out in the yard, if you're feeling hot, right, you're feeling tired, dizzy, it's time to go inside. We want you to be safe in the garden. So there you have it, your summer heat care. Be careful out there, folks. All right, Andy, let's talk a little bit about wildflowers. Oh, right. great, it's one of my favorite things. I, I, I could tell, <laughs> I see you brought us some here to look at today. Yeah, I, I did, uh, and also wanted to talk about it a bit. Sure. You know, sure. uh, at Lakeford Nature Center, our mission focuses on interpretation of native wildlife. Okay. And we do a lot of interpretation on butterflies, particularly mm -hmm. monarchs, and I think every garden should have some uh, milkweed in it. Nice. But, but mm -hmm. you know, we cover that all the time. So today I wanted to talk to you about uh, uh, sturdy, reliable plants for our area okay. uh, that are good for the garden, uh, for the birds, the bees, and just for their beauty. Okay. Uh, so, so these are native? These are native plants. Native plants are plants that were, well, there's a million different definitions. And, <laughs> I'm, and I'm you, sure. And you really can get stuck in the mud if you just, uh, you know, find, you know, just fight over it. But most people say plants that were here before European colonization. Okay, I've heard that. Okay. But, you know, some have naturalized, you know, Queen Anne's lace and mm -hmm, that sort of mm -hmm, stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, but, uh, a lot of native plants, um, not, I mean, a lot of native insects only eat, and by eat, I mean uh, talk about eating the leaves okay. of native plants. So they're uh, very important in the environment for uh, bugs and such. Uh, also, well, a lot of 
like hummingbirds and bees and butterflies will uh, get nectar from almost any plant, right. anything that's blooming and all that sort of stuff. But if you want to have uh, butterflies and even beetles, that's uh, all important for biodiversity, you really need a, a variety of uh, different native plants. Okay. Unfortunately, native plants have been oversold. Just because you, uh, you know, they grow in this area doesn't mean they may or may not be a good choice for your backyard. Okay, that's a good point. Uh, you know, some plants are easier to grow than others, and so I want to talk about three of my favorite plants okay. in regards to uh, how to grow them, how to grow them with uh, minimal muss and fuss, and how to grow more of them. Okay. So uh, the first uh, plant I uh, want to talk about uh, blooms in early spring. You know, uh, uh, there are uh, variations every season. Some things bloom early, middle, and late. And the plants we're going to talk about always bloom in the same sequence. But if we have an early spring, they may bloom early, earlier than, than later times. Okay. But it's one of my favorites called Baptisia. Right. Well, I call it Baptisia. Uh, uh, but uh, uh, the common name, although that's not that common, is uh, false wild blue indigo. Okay. Indigo was a plant they used for dye to uh, dye blue jeans and such. Yes. Uh, it's a legume. I mean, it's part of the uh, 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 pea family. Right. <laughs> uh, they have remarkable seed pods. They do. That's impressive. Uh, they're green now. Uh, they'll eventually turn black if the, they last long enough for the birds to eat them. If you uh, open them up, and I don't know if they can see that on camera, but you can see all little baby peas. And as the season goes on and they mature, they'll be almost as, as big as English peas as you get in the grocery store. Wow. I don't know if they're edible, but they're really pretty that way. But uh, if you don't want them to reseed, which they will, okay. uh, you can simply uh, uh, clip the, uh, uh, the, the seeds off. Baptisia also has a real pretty color. It's kind of a blue-green. Yeah, I liked it. Um, I like it. And if you grow it in full sun, it's a sturdy plant and doesn't need staking. But if you uh, cut it back by a third after it blooms, and you'll probably get a lot of these off if you cut off by a third, it makes a nice round blue-green shrub that stands up without staking the entire season. Okay. Okay. Uh, and I say, you know, after it blooms and such, uh, but uh, you can uh, uh, cut this back. It makes a nice shrub, so it gives you early spring pretty blue blooms. Uh, later on, uh, you'll have the seed, green seed pods. They'll turn to black, and you'll have a blue-green shrub. Uh, right now in Memphis, there's another form of Baptisia. It's another species, Baptisia alba, that's white indigo. Okay. It's not quite as bushy, but it has spectacular tall white blooms. Oh. Uh, the second one, and uh, this one is blooming right now, and who, what's not to like about this, but uh, purple coneflower. Yeah, so, that's a beautiful. Yeah, uh, the, the, the scientific name is Echinacea uh, uh, purpurea, and what's not to like about it? Yeah. Uh, I mean, it's just, it's just beautiful. It's got you know, purple leaves, uh, uh, yellow seed head that turns black. Mm -hmm. uh, the uh, parts of the plants are, are, have medicinal uses. In fact, you go to the health food store, uh, you can buy all sorts of echinacea type supplements. I believe they're good for colds and other things. People ask me, well, how can I grow enough uh, of this plant uh, for herbal use? And say, well, you have to have a field. You know, if you're looking for medicinal plants and all like that, your backyard is probably not big enough. And so oh, wow. Just, yeah, but uh, okay. uh, the seed heads are just uh, also good bird food. Uh, about the time that the seed heads start uh, maturing, uh, the, uh, uh, the goldfinches are in their breeding plumage. They're brilliant, and it's just... It's really something to look in your yard and see them eating the heads of the uh, seed heads of the echinacea. I clipped this off. This is going to have lateral blooms coming off. Okay. You can do fun things with uh, echinacea as far as pruning. Like if it's uh, blooming purple and you've got something next to it you think looks terrible, <laughs> well, you can uh, clip it back um, uh, in middle of May and uh, it will delay the blooming and, uh, it will, uh, and sometimes it'll even bloom more. It will encourage both lateral and basal growth on the oh, plant. Oh, neat. Hey, okay. So uh, it, uh, it gives you different effects. Also, if you've got it, uh, uh, like Baptiste, if you have it in full sun, it's going to stand up right unless you have a wind or something. But if you do pruning at various points, you can give a, a sturdier plant that doesn't need staking. Okay. Nice. Um, the uh, uh, last plant is uh, New England Aster. Uh, it, it's for fall bloom. Uh, uh, this one is for it. I don't know if they'll be able to see it on the camera, but it just uh, yeah, uh, just cool. happens to have a, a, a single flower. In the fall, these are covered in masses of flowers. Okay. Um, and uh, it's just really spectacular having the blue with the yellow centers. It also gives you a, a late season uh, food source for, for bees, monarch butterflies mm -hmm. coming through mm -hmm. and that sort of mm -hmm. stuff. Uh, just like the other plants, if it's in full sun, it doesn't need as much staking. Uh, but uh, during the year, and I typically cut this off, guess what, July 4th, but I'll go, <laughs> okay. I'll, I'll go back and, and clip back 
So uh, the, you know, the tops include uh, to, to make bushier, smaller plants. Okay. And this particular, particularly important if you get the wild, true uh, uh, New England aster because those are six foot uh, tall plants. Wow. So a lot of us uh, don't uh, necessarily want or have the room for six foot tall plants in your yard. And so you, um, you know, buy named cultivars, you know, cultivated variety that have been bred for more profuse flowering and uh, uh, shorter stature. Uh, this particular cultivar, we call it Lichman Mystery. Oh, and it's a, I mean, it's a mystery. Yeah, okay. actually, uh, about, about 10 or 15 years ago, uh, a volunteer gave us a start of this plant, and we, it, we, it, we know it's a uh, New England aster, uh, we know it's a cultivar, but we don't know, know which one, so we just call it the Lick Room Mystery. But uh, most reputable garden centers have named cultivars, and like I said, the big advantage of the named uh, cultivars is that they stay lower, okay. and th they're bred specifically for bright, intense colors and, um, and, and a low mounding habit. Wow. Uh, with the echinacea and the baptisia, we, the, they both reseed in your garden. If you save the seeds, you'll want to read online about uh, scarification. Yeah. You know, wildflowers, you know, like I said, just because you can't grow them in your yard don't mean that uh, they want to. Sometimes it's harder than you think. Okay. But there's a couple of easy steps, like with echinacea, about storing them in wet sand in the refrigerator, these sort of things yeah, that you can that. read about online for both baptisia and echinacea if you collect the seeds to grow later. Uh, my technique is less formal. Uh, they, <laughs> particularly the echinacea has like a 200% germination rate. Not, not really, of course. But, <laughs> but every every seed that the that the, that the birds don't eat seems to germinate. Oh, okay. And so That's you, uh, good, so with the baptisia and echinacea, I'm just about running out of friends to share them with. Wow. Okay. Uh, but uh, so what I've done, I dig them up. We uh, sell them in our annual plant sale. Yes, yes. But uh, it, it, it's good if you like them. But but if you, of course, if you cut these back before they uh, go to seed, that reduces the seed counts. Okay. The asters reproduce differently, particularly named cultivars. You know, named cultivars are crossbreeds of different types of plants. And so the seeds, although I don't think there's a particularly high germination rate for asters, but they may not come true from seed, but they grow through your garden. You've got to be prepared to kind of keep the aster in bounds after it fills out the space okay. you want it to, which is easily done. But you propagate the asters by root division. Root division. Yeah, you just basically okay. uh, look at a plant and you you, you you cut off chunks that you want. You move them elsewhere. Sometimes in in, in groups of plants, you have uh, the middle of it kind of st uh, starts failing on you, and so you, it's really easy to rearrange their tough plants. I do recommend doing that work in spring, certainly well before Fourth of July. Well before the Fourth. Yeah, I was exactly. waiting for you to say that. Andy, we appreciate that information about wildflowers, and I can tell these are your favorites. Oh, they are. I have all <laughs> uh, each, all these plants are in my yard, uh, <laughs> blooming their heads off right now. All right. Well, thank you much. Whenever you grow zucchini, pumpkins, any kind of squash, you're going to get squash bugs, and they can be a serious problem. Now, right here on the leaf on the zucchini plant, we have a squash bug. That's the adult, right there. The adults can be a vector of bacterial wilt, which can flatten your squash plant in just a day. It'll look great one day, the next day it'll just be completely wilted and flat on the ground. These bugs are really, really hard to control. So one of the best ways to control them is to get rid of their eggs. So right here, they lay their eggs on the bottom side of the leaf. They look like little bronze footballs. And the easiest way to get rid of them that I found, I just take some duct tape and form it into a loop and you can just stick them to the eggs and it just lifts them right off the leaf. Also, when the eggs hatch into small nymphs, the uh, nymphs stick to the tape really well too. So with a little bit of duct tape, you can have completely organic control of the squash bug. All right, Booger, here's our Q&A segment. You ready? I'm ready. Uh, we have some good questions here. Okay. Uh, here's our first viewer email. Can you please identify this weed that is taking over our yard and flower beds? It seems to be growing as I'm standing there. <laughs> what can I do to make it go away forever? It is a vine like underneath and spreads and chokes down everything. Help. And this is Jenny. That, so what do you think that is? <laughs> got a lot of time we uh, weed to go away forever. <laughs> yeah, forever, <laughs> forever. Not, let me know about that weed. Thing. How you, <laughs> you do that? Look like ground ivy. Mm -hmm. There could be ground ivy in there. And we had a lot of rain too, you know, and that would cause it to grow a lot. Right. And, 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 you know, it's do that, especially allowing whole water a little bit in, in there. I pour drain it, and you will see that ground ivy in there. Right. But to get rid of it forever? Yeah, <laughs> I, I, I don't know now. You can use some like 2,4-D, it might spray it on there. 
just read the label on that before you start using that on there. Okay. But it will. That might help some. Okay. Then next time they come along with a pre-emerge or something, put down right, right, on, on, this, on, this, on, the, on your lawn. Okay. That might help some too in that area. Yeah, I think that would help. Mm -hmm. If you got poor drain, try to fix the drainage problem there. Right. That would help in that too. It's the old ground ivy, or some people call it creeping Charlie. Creeping Charlie. You know what, Doc? I got some in my yard. Oh, do you? <laughs> yeah, I got I some in my yard. Yeah. Yeah. I got some in my yard. Little, little <laughs> small not spot. exempt from that. <laughs> not exempt, man. All that rain can help the rain. See, <laughs> your ground ivy is pretty tough. Uh, it does spread by stolons. Okay. Uh, it's a perennial. It's actually in the mint family. So if okay. you crush it up, it actually uh, smells like mint. Okay. Uh, we usually see it in the spring and in the summertime. How about culturally? Make sure you grow a thick stand of grass. Thick stand of grass and that right. check the soil pitch and all that. Make right. sure it's good. Keep the right height when you cut your grass. That's right. That'll help a lot of things too. Okay. Hope that helps you out, Miss Jenny. Okay. All right. Here's our next via email. How do you recommend control of annual bluegrass in a fine fescue lawn? And that fescue is rubble. Okay. Is there a post-emergent herbicide that can be used? And this is from Mark and Deb from Lebanon, Tennessee. Okay, then. All right. So specifically, they want to know if, if there is a post-emergent herbicide to control annual bluegrass in fine fescue. It's kind of hard to do that now. You can oh. be kind of hard to do it because wow. both of them like kind of like cool season grass. Mm -hmm. But it's hard to get that out of there, that, that out of uh, your fescue with lawn. Right. It's, yeah. it's going to be, you have limited options. Limited options you do, yeah. Because both of them kind of growing on the same time, doing the same thing. Both of them are grasses too like that in there. Right. It's kind of hard to do that in there. Right. That's going to be very baby, tough. Yeah. Uh, I know in some publications, even the UT Extension <laughs> publication, they will say, you could probably use a glyphosate, but you have to be careful. Yeah, be careful when you, that. Yeah, you yeah, use yeah. that to spot spray. Yeah. Uh, no. But I like to talk about culturally. Yeah. So the reason why you would have the poana is a couple. Of, you know, there's a couple of different things there. Yeah. You know, either their ground is high in nitrogen, okay. phosphorus. Mm -hmm. You have poor drainage, poor or drainage. you have guess what? Compact soil. Compact soil, yeah. And that's right. why I like to recommend right. average the soil sometimes. You know, do that in there. Try to loosen that soil up some. Right. That might help some. It's hard to keep control of that. Yeah. I mean, it's, <laughs> it's a very difficult weed to control. But yeah, I'll be careful not to apply any nitrogen fertilizer yeah. as we go into the fall. Mm -hmm. Uh, improve the drainage, you know, it, in your yard, for sure. Check the pH of your soil, mm -hmm. because a lot of times your phosphorus and potassium can add up in the soil and build up. Normally, normally your nitrogen count just leaks itself out over a period of time, but right. be careful on that nitrogen fertilizer, especially going to the fall of the year. Sure, for sure. Because, mm -hmm. uh, again, that's going to encourage the growth of some of your right, right. grass. Right, right, and also then right. we have a real hard free and damage your grass, too. Okay. Yeah, mm -hmm. so you definitely want to uh, make sure you don't do that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but poana is tough. That's what it that is, yeah. your annual bluegrass, and mm -hmm. something else, too. A pre-emergent would help. Pre-emergent would help. Right. Yeah, so yeah. something like dimension is what we yeah, recommend. Snapshot. Yes. Snapshot yeah, would be, be really good. Uh, good. That, yeah. So I, yeah, I would go with a pre-emerge because it's going to be very difficult. Difficult to do that. Yeah. Uh, to control annual bluegrass in any type of grass. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Whether it's fescue <laughs> or warm season grass, yeah, for right. sure. But read and follow the label on all your herbicides. Okay. Mm -hmm. So thank you for that question, uh, Mark and Depp. Here's our next viewer email. What pre-emergent and post-emergent weed killer should I use for sand spurs in Florida? Yard is too full to pull by hand, and this is Nick. YouTube, so sand spar, which is actually uh, almost like birdweed. Birdweed, okay. Uh, it has little burrs on it. Um, so, first thing I would do is I would go to my local extension office there. Yeah, you know, see, see they recommend, uh, there in Florida, yeah. wherever mm -hmm. you are, and uh, see what they recommend. recommend yeah. uh, because here's something: we don't know the type of grass that he has. Yeah, yeah. Right. right. So it might be Saint Augustine. Yeah. It might be some Georgia, but somebody, we don't know yeah. that. Typical uh, locust down for there. Sure. So they, they have some good information on there. Probably got a publication on there. I'm sure they that do. You, and give you all the information there. Right, right. But not knowing the grass definitely makes it tough. Tough. To now, for some you. of the warm season grasses that we're familiar with up this way, I mean, you can use a pre-emergent. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, for us here in the Memphis area, there right. would be something like pendimethylene. Okay, then. Right? And then a post-emerge would be something like quinclorac. Quinclorac, okay, right. then. But that's for the area up here. Yeah, you yeah. know, for our grasses here. They also need to visit, this area. visit look at right. off down there and see what they recommend down there in that uh, area. That's what yeah. I would do. Yeah, I would definitely I'd do, do that. Yeah. Because, again, we don't know the type of grass that he's growing. No, wrong way, right. Right. So mm -hmm. we don't want to recommend the wrong thing that might kill some of those grasses. So, Nikki, if you can uh, contact your county it's extension office and see what they recommend to control sand spurs. Sand spur, okay. Again, which is pretty much, you know, close the, to bird weed because they actually have little birds on them. Yeah, real thing. Right, and yeah, can take over. Take over your line, yeah. Right. So, mm -hmm. hey, you have it, Nick. We appreciate that question. <laughs> All right, here's our next viewer email. Okay, okay. I purchased a couple of moonflower vines from a local store which had plenty of blooms at the time. I planted in a good potty mix and placed them beside a trellis mm -hmm. to climb. Since then, all I get is plenty of vine growth, but no blooms. <laughs> what am I doing wrong? And this is Roger from Knoxville, okay. Tennessee. All right, so the old moonflower moon vine. It look, right. look good. A lot of times we check when they buy plant, try to buy a plant with less bloom on there. Oh, okay. And then a lot of things he probably doing though, is giving a whole lot of nitrogen fertilizer. Mm -hmm. 
right. again a lot of growth on there you see begin to grow real fast don't have time to set blooms on there that's probably what they're doing and probably need a little sunlight too and everything right. in there so in there okay when you go to the store i like to, it's good to have one or two blooms on there when you buy a plant but that's about all you need in there to see what color you're going to have in there but then get one get a lot of buds on there Okay. But they probably, and hold back on that nitrogen fertilizer. Hold back, huh? They probably need more like phosphatasm or something in there to get that good strong root system and help put on a lot more blooms in there. Okay. They do, yeah. Yeah, moonflower vines are beautiful. Beautiful, yeah. Yes, uh, My grandma had one. alba. Oh, okay. Uh, it, it, it's what that is. Yeah, alba means white. Yeah, so yeah, I, yeah, I actually like the vines. It's very beautiful. Yeah. Uh, a lot of people, uh, of course, you know, some master gardeners that told me this before, they actually grow them in smaller pots to force the blooms. Okay, then. Because they actually don't bloom until midsummer, late summer, into okay. the fall. Make so mid, late hard. summer, uh, into the fall, if they're in pots, but okay. they're in smaller pots to force the bloom. Okay. But this is in this yard. Mm -hmm. So the thing about it is full sun. Full sun, need full sun. Need full sun Hold for the, the blooms. Night. Hold back on the nitrogen fertilizer. Hold back on the nitrogen fertilizer. fertilizer. Yeah. Probably needs phosphorus for, the, you for, know, for the blooms, mm -hmm. for, uh, for sure. A lot of water. A lot of water. <laughs> yeah, a lot of water. <laughs> a lot of water, yeah. Of the year. Okay. Yeah, and then... Uh, Put a little organic material around the roots, <laughs> a little compost. That'll help the as compost, well. Working into the soil yeah, right now. Working into good, the soil. Yeah. That'd be good. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. I and think it should be fine. Yeah, so that's good. Keep the compost soil in there. Keep that nitrogen in there. Make sure the soil drain well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, beautiful plant again. So yeah. thank you, Roger, for yeah, the question. Mm -hmm. We hope that helps you out. All right, Mr. Booker. That's it. That's, that's all, it. all we have for today. Okay. Good questions, huh? Hey, good question. Good question. Right. Yeah. Thank you for being here. We appreciate that. I enjoyed that. Yes. Remember, we love to hear from you. Send us an email or letter. The email address is familyplots at wkno.org, and the mailing address is familyplots 7151 Cherry Farms Road, Cordova, Tennessee 38016. Or you can go online to familyplotgarden.com. That's all we have time for today. Thanks for joining us. If you need more information about summer lawn care or growing wildflowers, go to familyplotsgarden.com. We have information on hundreds of garden topics with thousands of videos. Be sure to join us next week for the family plot, gardening in the Mid-South. Be safe.